welcome to this um, afternoon's seminar. Now, before we begin, just a, a few housekeeping. My presentation is very, very video and image heavy, uh, but I want you to really, really enjoy that. Um, and so I don't want us to chew up each other's bandwidth. So um, may I please request that we all turn off our webcams and turn our microphones to mute and then you can turn them back on again later at the end and you can ask me some questions. I'm going to imagine you all are still there so don't worry okay just because I don't want I want you to really enjoy the visual experience and I don't want you to compromise your bandwidth. But we'll get started now. <laughs> don't want that one again. Um, so for those of you who are unfamiliar with the continent of Australia, like Indonesia, it is divided into very, very distinct states. And you will find the University of Queensland in, of course, the state of Queensland. And while you might be very familiar with other capital cities in Australia, like Melbourne and Sydney, uh, Tasmania even, um, Brisbane is the state capital of Queensland. And I've been here for about 10 years. You can tell that I'm not originally from Australia. I am your neighbor, Indonesia. I, you can guess where I'm from later on. Um, but I've been here for a good 10 years now. I came here to study. I did my PhD here and now I'm teaching here. So I teach ecology and zoology. So zoology, the study of animals and ecology, the understanding, the processes that explain why we see the animals and plants that we see. So that's what I teach here and a little bit of today's lecture is going to involve those disciplines as well as we explore whether or not those cute and colorful animated characters like Pokemon, whether or not they are biologically possible. And as someone who really, really loves animals, and I'm sure many of you do too, um, Queensland was really the most outstanding place for me to study zoology because of the diversity of wildlife that you find here. And the reason why you find lots of different animals in a place like Queensland is because of the diversity of ecosystems that you find in this state. So all the way up there to the north of the state is um, tropical rainforest, not dissimilar to Indonesia. Um, and then Brisbane, the state capital is subtropical. And right now, in fact, it's our winter season. Um, and uh, this is the area where you find your very, very iconic koalas, kangaroos that you're familiar with. Not forgetting also that Brisbane is home to the seventh wonder of the world. So fringing the coast of Brisbane is the Great Barrier Reef. Um, I told you a while ago that it's, it's, it's now our winter time now. Even though I say that, we, it doesn't really get very, very cold. It's cool, it doesn't snow here. It's a really, really nice temperate environment. But perhaps the best time to come and visit us if you're planning on coming for a holiday is springtime, just when winter is over. Springtime happens because we're in the Southern Hemisphere in a complete reverse to the Northern Hemisphere. So springtime for us is really um, September going into October. And the reason why springtime is such a nice time to come and visit is because all around Brisbane and absolutely stunning, spectacular happens. This is our campus. That is the Brisbane city at the end. This is our campus in what appears to look like a little island. Um, we have about 50,000 students that study here at, um, at UQ. And like I said, springtime is when you find this absolutely spectacular botanical sensation. And that happens um, in some of the trees that you find all along the Eastern seaboard of Australia. So you might have heard before in Japan, you've got the cherry blossoms that bloom once a year. We have our very own version of cherry blossoms that bloom in the springtime, except they're not pink, they're purple. And these are the very, very iconic flowers of the jacaranda. Okay, this is the plant that we have, which is also why UQ is oftentimes associated with the color purple. We have lots of jacaranda trees on campus. Uh, we're gonna now go straight into our lecture and those of you that do play the game will be familiar that Pokemon, oh, there are just an absolutely incredible diversity of Pokemon. Over 1,000 different Pokemon that have been drawn. Um, but if you look very, very closely at them, you will notice that many of these cartoon characters, they look very familiar to you, even if you don't play the game, because when cartoonists draw their inspiration, oftentimes they draw their inspiration from the natural world. So plants and animals that we interact with, and then that forms the basis of their creativity. 
Now, there's so many that we can talk about and I only have so little time with you. So I'm going to share with you two stories today and hopefully take you through a little bit of the science behind some of these animals and what we can learn from them and how they have benefited mankind. So unfortunately, we only have time for two stories, but I hope that you appreciate that we go into a bit more depth per story. One of the things I wanted to say is that we remember that while so much of creativity and expression comes from our inspiration from the natural world, we are losing our natural world at quite an alarming rate. Indonesia, of course, you are completely familiar with some of the crises that happen over there, largely a political one when you are dealing with, you know, what decisions should you make when you are, should you protect the environment or should you, you know, provide for the livelihoods of your people. It's not a difficult decision for your government to make and um, Indonesia are losing a lot of its diversity, but that's not exclusive to a country like Indonesia as well. All around the world, because of the growth of the human population, we encroach on the territory and habitats of these plants and animals, and we do lose quite a few of them on a day, uh, uh, not on a daily, but on a yearly basis. So I wanted to consider uh, whether or not these Pokemon that I'm about to show you are biologically possible. Now, throughout my presentation, if at any point in time you feel like you have a question for me, please do not hesitate to type it in to the chat group. So you might see that there's a little chat group um, and I should be able to see the chat group as they turn up. And if you have questions, I can answer them on the go. Or we can wait till the very end as well. Okay, so let's start with something very simple. Do you know what Pokemon that is? I'm sure some of you have played the game and you know the name. This was from the very, very first generation, 20 years ago. I remember when Pokemon first came out. That Pokemon was, is Butterfree. Thank you, Matthew. And um, yes, I was only a little boy uh, when Pokemon first came out. You all know the name of this one here. Now, without saying, of course, the inspiration behind this Pokemon, Butterfree over here. Thank you, Matthew, again is a butterfly. This here is a Richmond's birdwing. It is a species endemic to this part of the world here in Australia, and it's one of the world's largest butterflies. Now you have the living creature there, and you have the Pokemon there I've animated in the front of it. I'd like for you to just have a quick observation and try to think about what are some of the similarities and some of the differences that you see. So do this on your own. I'll give you a few more seconds. What are some of the things that they share in common? What are some of the things that are very obviously different? Okay, and we'll have a bit of a, a, a quick discussion about that shortly. Remember, we're trying to determine if this Pokemon was a real Pokemon, whether or not it is biologically possible. Now, if we consider some of the similarities, then one of the first things that you're gonna pick up on is the very fact that like the Pokemon, the living creature also has really large eyes, really large beady eyes. And for a lot of insects that rely on vision to, in order to see, like butterflies that are active largely during the daytime, they do rely on vision a lot, finding their food source. Of course, you remember from primary school that butterflies take up nectar as a food source and they find that food source in flowers. Now, Butterflies don't see the environment in the same way that we humans see the environment. Um, we see color in a certain spectrum and butterflies and a lot of other insects don't. In fact, butterflies and bees, they're actually able to see in the ultraviolet spectrum, the UV spectrum. And so to us, we can look at a flower in nature and it's red or it's pink or it's blue, but to a butterfly, it actually glows very brightly because they can see the ultraviolet radiation of the flower. And so they can actually hone in on flowers very quickly relative to, when, relative to us. Uh, you also notice that both the Pokemon and the living creature, on the top of their heads, they have a pair of antennae. And I always like asking this question when I'm with high school students, and that is to tease them a little bit. What do you think the antennae is used for? And the answer is not telekinesis. They can't do that and nobody can. Okay. Um, 
antennae on an insect are incredibly sensitive instruments. In fact, far more sensitive than any man-made device that we have invented. And the purpose of the antennae and insects is really largely for them to be able to detect chemicals in their environment. Unlike us, they don't have a respiratory system, they don't have a nasal system. We breathe and we smell using the same organ. Butterflies don't do that, okay? Insects don't do that. And insects rely on their antennae as their sense of smell and they detect really, really minute particles of, of chemicals in the environment. You must be wondering, you know, you know, sometimes you're at home and you're maybe cooking or you watch your parents, they're cooking for you. And then out of nowhere, a housefly appears, right? How did it know it had food there, you know? How did it know? Um, well, that's because this housefly, which might have been kilometers away, okay, is very, very quick to detect even the smallest particle of chemicals in the environment. And so they hone in on, on these things very, very quickly. But there are some very, very obvious differences. And perhaps one of the biggest differences that you might see is that they have differences in the number of legs. So you've learned in primary school that all insects have these rules that you apply to their anatomy. In primary school, you learn that all insects have how many legs? Six legs. And how many body parts? Three body parts. You learn all this in school. And you notice that the Pokemon does not conform to those rules. And so what you have here is a situation where, you know, we have these rules that govern biology, but then exceptions to the rules. And this is a good opportunity to tell you that, you know, you are learning lots of rules at school. Those of you that are doing mathematics or physics, you know, you learn lots of formula. There are set rules that govern what you learn presently at high school. But as soon as you start university is when you're going to realize that while you have all these rules, there are always exceptions to those rules. And so while you've learned that all insects have six legs, check this one out. And you'll notice that this butterfly, it's got four legs, okay? No, two legs have not been pulled off, but it's got four legs. And that's because this particular species here, the monarch butterfly, which you also find in Indonesia, in its natural distribution, the monarch butterfly is a migratory species. They fly over vast distances. And for an animal that is migratory and flies over vast distances, the less weight you carry, the further you go. So it is to the advantage of this particular butterfly to only have four instead of six legs. Now, another difference that you might see is in the mouth parts. You notice that in the living creature, the butterfly has what appears to be a drinking straw that's coiled up. The technical term for this structure is proboscis. And they use the proboscis like a straw, and the proboscis can extend to the depths of a flower in order to drink up the nectar, the liquid food source. The Pokemon, however, does not have this coiled up structure. In fact, it's got a mouth part, and it's even got, if you can see closely, a pair of teeth, fangs, if you like. And if real butterflies had fangs on their mouth parts, I don't think we'd be too fond of them. Again, what did we say a while ago to rules? Again, while we learn that there are all these commonalities and all these principles and all these rules, there are always exceptions to those rules. Check this butterfly out. This one here is actually an ancestral species and, and it's still present today, but we can describe it as having very primitive and so it doesn't have the proboscis, it doesn't have a drinking straw. Now, unlike the Pokemon, it doesn't have a mouth part with teeth, but it does have these mandibles. And that's because this particular species of butterfly does not drink nectar. It feeds on pollen, the solid packets of proteins inside flowers as well. So it feeds on them. In fact, you can see there's a lot of dust on its face. And that's because it's a pollen feeder and that can, what, can get quite messy. So we consider again the question, you know, with all these exceptions to the rules from everything from number of legs right down to specific structures, including mouth parts, could a Pokemon like Butterfree be biologically possible? Some might say yes, some might say no. Those that played the game will recall that the size of this Pokemon is almost the size of a living human. 
So maybe in terms of body size, there's no way this Pokemon is biologically possible. They simply can't get quite large. So I'd like us to actually learn a little bit more about butterflies. And what, one thing you notice about this particular individual here is that you can see how brilliantly colored it is. It's got this most spectacular blue color. This is a blue morpho butterfly. It is a species that is endemic to Central America. And I'm going to take you out of the slideshow now. And so you can see me and I'll just, and I can also see the chat, can I? Yes, I can. And what I wanted to show you is I actually happen to have a specimen of one. Let me just quickly adjust my camera so that you can all see. So I actually have a specimen of a blue morpho here. We don't ask questions on how I obtain said specimen, but I do have one here. And one thing you'll notice again, even though this butterfly is dead, it's preserved, yet it's retained its color so very, very well. Now, obviously if I did this in person, it's gonna be so much better, but I can't, I'm not there in person, but I am going to try and move it around. And hopefully you can see that as I move it around, based on the angle from my picture frame, my butterfly frame to the camera of my webcam, you will notice that the shade of blue is changing in color, right? Based on the angle. Can you see that? I'll tell you something that's really, really absolutely phenomenal about these butterflies. Not exclusive to this species, but oftentimes when you see the iridescent color in butterfly wings, they show you color, you can see the blue, but guess what? They do not produce any blue at all. They don't produce any pigment at all. Your skin, your eyes, your hair, you can see the color of your skin and your eyes and your hair because there's pigment in your cells. You can see the blue in this butterfly, yet this butterfly produces no pigment at all. And it's got everything to do with a little concept we call structural color. So not producing color from pigment, but rather producing color from the structure. And so if we zoom in on the structure of a butterfly's wing, you might be surprised to find that butterfly wing structures are not one big piece. If you take a if you ever find a dead butterfly, don't go and kill a butterfly just to do this, please. But if you find a dead butterfly, pick it up, take it into your science lab and ask your teacher to let you have a look at it under a microscope. And under a microscope, you'll be able to see that butterfly wing structures, let me get my laser pointer up, that butterfly wing structures are in fact a collection of scales like this image here on the left that overlap each other. And if you take one of those scales and zoom in further, now your school microscope won't allow you to see this, but what you will see with this high resolution scanning electron micrograph, you can see that the structures of the scale are incredibly complex. Lots of ridges and ditches, you know, lots of complexity. If we have a look at the cross section of the butterfly's wing, many of you are familiar with this unit of measurement. This is centimeters, right down to this. Hopefully you know what this is. This is micrometers. So we are down to an incredibly small resolution incredibly incredibly small now and you will see that butterfly wing structures look like little christmas trees don't they this is the hint that tells you something about structural color because imagine my laser pointer you should be able to see a red dot on the screen and what some of you that have done basic physics would have learned is that light particles they travel in a straight line fashion they travel as a wave but in a straight line Okay, so imagine that this is a particle of light traveling in a straight line. And as soon as it touches the surface of one of these Christmas tree structures, there's going to be some of those particles that bounce off and into your eye, but there are going to be other particles of light that bounce in between the Christmas tree structures and essentially get trapped. And so these Christmas tree structures allow specific wavelengths of light to be reflected. And that is what gives you the color that you see. So essentially, in a very simple way of thinking, 
um, these structures absorb specific colors, but relief specific colors, reflect specific colors, and those are the colors that you see. How cool is that? And you're wondering whether or not we are able to take our understanding of structural color and incorporate it, incorporate it into our daily lives. And the answer is yes. And those of you that are familiar with products like Kindles, when you use a Kindle or an e-book, so essentially this is um, a device that you can read books from. You, of course, have to purchase the book subscription, but then you can read the book. And those of you that have used such products before will know that there is something really unique about these products. And that is that you can look at this, the page of this Kindle and it can be a very dark night. It can be a very bright day. When you're reading off a Kindle, it's as if you're reading off the page of a book. And that's because the screen of the Kindle utilizes tiny little nanoparticles that mimic butterfly wing structures. And they take advantage of our understanding of how these structures are able to produce their own color to manufacture this screen. Can our smartphones do this? No, because on a very bright day, you're out in the sun, you know, having a bit of a walk. Well, maybe not at this time, you have to stay at home. But you know, it's a really, really bright day. Our iPhones, our smartphones, the screen, our iPads, the screen is made of glass. And so what happens is that the sunlight is reflecting through that glass and again into your eye and what you see is a glare. So it's very uncomfortable sometimes because the screen is a glass. So you're wondering, so why don't we have screens like the Kindle? So the current technology is such that the screen of the Kindle is only black and white. You can't see color beyond those structures. And so the next generation smartphones, those screens will resemble the Kindle. It's just about figuring out which structures give you which color. And as soon as we've worked that out, we can produce the next generation smartphones and you'll never ever have an issue with glare. Too bright, too dim, that will be a problem of the past. It will automatically adjust comfortably relative to the brightness in your surroundings and comfortably a, a brightness that, to enter your eyes. And we use structural color to do that. And that really is some of the research that we do here at the University of Queensland. Within physics as a discipline, optics is a really, really important, um, uh, uh, I guess, uh, field of study within physics. You know, understanding light particles and how they behave and the different materials that might allow them to behave um, is, is, is this discipline called optics, which is in physics. So if you're wondering, you know, what are some of the careers that come out of the science? Isn't this quite dynamic? So you have people like me who consider ourselves zoologists who study these animals, but study interesting properties of these animals. Then we can then take it to people who call themselves say biophysicists or quantum physicists that are able to understand energy and how energy is reacting to some of the structures that we see in nature. And then might then pass on those concepts and that understanding to people like material scientists or engineers that are able to produce those nanoparticles right down to people who might be mathematicians or information technologists that write the code that uh, programs you know the way these nanostructures work and of course then someone that actually builds the device and of course at the very end someone that sells that device and makes the money right but you see a lot of our you know, everyday devices and the devices of tomorrow rely so deeply on science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And so these are some of the careers associated. And of course, lots of programs that get you there. I hope you enjoyed that story. Now we have time for a second story. Anybody want to tell me what this one is? Matthew, you want to have a go? You know what this one is? The name. I'll have a sip of my tea. Oh, it happens to have a butterfly on my cup. So some of you are guessing the name of this Pokemon is Whooper. 
And you must be wondering what sort of animal this Pokemon is. What is the inspiration behind uh, Whooper? It's a little bizarre. It looks like this. Oh, what is that? This animal is called an axolotl. There is another common name. It's called the Mexican walking fish but it's very deceiving because it's not a fish. It is in fact an amphibian and they're related to frogs and toads. Axolotls, you will find them being kept as pets. They are available to be kept as pets and they're pretty straightforward, except you should never put two axolotls in the same tank. And we'll have a bit of a chat about that shortly. So that's the real animal there, and that's the Pokemon in the animation next to it. Want to have a think about similarities and differences that you see. Have a go, okay? What are some similarities? What are some differences that you can see? Have a look. Okay, so uh, some of you are messaging me privately because you're shy, oh, that's all right. Don't worry, if you're shy, that's fine, okay? Uh, you can absolutely message me privately on the chat group if you have questions like I see here. Okay, so let's talk about some similarities that you might be able to see. And perhaps some of the similarities, perhaps a very, very obvious one, is that both the Pokemon as well as the living animals is absolutely tiny, simple eyes that are very unlike the human eye. So you see my beautiful eye over here? See how complex your human eye is. Um, this animal though, the eye of this animal is not very, very complex. It can see, but it doesn't actually rely on vision very much. And the reason why such an animal doesn't rely on vision very much is because in the natural range of such animals, they occupy cave habitats. So they live in the depths of caves. And in caves, complete darkness. So while they can see, vision is very poor. Eyesight is very poor because these animals have never needed to see. They live, they live in really, really poorly lit conditions. And in some cases, complete darkness. And there are some species of axolotls or salamanders that are completely blind and they don't have eyes at all. And they're quite cool in my opinion. So this guy here doesn't ne never really need it to see. The other similarity that you might see is that, like some of your friends, they have a very big mouth, right? They have a huge mouth. You know, why do you need such a big mouth? Of course, your, your friends with big mouths, they, they can't stop talking. But for an axolotl, an animal like an axolotl, why does it need such a big mouth? And some of you are probably guessing that it's got probably something to do with food. Because the bigger your mouth, the bigger the food you can eat. And this is important because in cave habitats, food is hard to come by. Food is very scarce. So you take what you can get. And so for an axolotl, if a tiny little, say, mosquito larva swims by, you'll eat it. If a tiny little fish swims by, you'll eat it. If a smaller axolotl walks by, you'll eat it. That's right. Axolotls will eat other axolotls. They're cannibalistic sometimes. And so it's important for those people that keep axolotls as pets, they shouldn't ever put two in the same tank because one, if larger than the other, will more than certainly have a go. Okay, so the other similarity that you might see off the side of its heads, these very complex structures over here. And you're wondering what these structures might be used for. And they're very complex. And a few things that you can observe is that they've got all these frilly little bits. Okay, look at all the frilly little bits. And that tells you that these structures have a lot of surface area. The other thing that you see are blood vessels. You can see blood vessels through these structures. Okay, and that tells you that it's got to use the blood vessels for a reason. Lots of blood vessels lots of surface area. This is actually helping the animal breathe. This is, these are gills. These are aquatic animals. They live in the water and they don't breathe because there is no air. There is no air. They have to extract the oxygen from the water and they do this through their gills. So those are gills that help the animal breathe. 
Now let's consider some differences between the animal and the axolotl. What are some differences that you see? There is a very key difference, right? The key difference is the Pokemon can receive Wi-Fi, right? You see, it can receive Wi-Fi, but the real animal cannot. No, I'm just kidding. Obviously, it's got what looks to be the Wi-Fi symbol, which, by the way, is an Australian invention. Without Australia, you would not have Wi-Fi. Australians invented Wi-Fi. And so the axolotl, perhaps one of the biggest difference is that the Pokemon stands upright and the living animal is flattened to the ground. And this is actually very significant, okay? Particularly for a biologist, we will pick up on these sorts of things because being able to stand upright like a human con con requires a considerable amount of evolution that has gone into the development of a critical structure in your body. What allows you to stand upright? Well, that is your vertebral columns, your spinal cord, your backbone. All of you would have done science in some shape and form, and you remember in your school, you have a skeleton, right? Obviously not a real skeleton, but a, a fake skeleton, a model. And what you notice when you look at the skeleton of a human is that it composes all these interlocking bits of bones, right? Interlocking pieces of vertebrae, right? You're familiar with those. And we can see each vertebra from the next. It's an interlocking backbone. And having an interlocking backbone is so crucial for us because it offers us a lot of flexibility. We can go from side to side. We can bend down and touch our toes, right? And having a spinal column like that also allows for the attachment of muscles that then support you standing upright. So let's have a look at an axolotl spine. And if you have a look at the axolotl spine here, you'll notice immediately something very different compared to the human spine. While it looks like you can see separations in the spine, if you look very, very closely, particularly in this image over here, you will notice that the spinal column in an axolotl, and in fact, all amphibians, is what we call a fused backbone. What this means is that this backbone, while it offers the animal a little bit of flexibility and a little bit of strength, it is in no way strong, as strong as our backbone, okay? And largely that's because these amphibians have spent a lot of their evolution and a lot of their life where? Underwater. And underwater, there are no effects of gravity pulling you down. They have never evolved a need to stand upright because they don't need much energy to do it. They can orientate themselves in a zero gravity medium very easily. But we, because we've terrestrialized, and by that I mean coming onto land, we have to deal with the effects of gravity. And a lot of land based animals have that capacity to stand upright largely because of the strength of our spinal column. So let's consider do you think Whooper, which stands upright, is biologically possible. Well, there are no living animals that are resembling Whooper that stand upright. So there's a very high chance that the way in which Whooper is drawn is certainly uh, not something, um, you know, not something that, that living animals are capable of doing. Okay, so we're gonna learn a little bit more about axolotls now because they're so incredibly cute. Look at this retardedly cute looking one, okay? And the reason why I use that term is because you'll notice that some of the arms of this axolotl are fully grown, like this one here. And on the other side, tiny little arms. It was not born this way, you know. It looks like it's a little bit deformed, but I promise you it's not deformed. You know what's happened here? Remember a while ago, I told you that you should never put two axolotls in the same tank because one will have a go at the other. And in this particular situation, one of its siblings has chomped off on one of its legs, actually two of its legs over here. But one thing that axolotls can do that we humans certainly cannot is the ability to regenerate their limbs. So when they undergo some injury, like their arm being chopped off, axolotls can regenerate their limbs. How cool is that? Now it takes some time, 
but they'll get there eventually, okay? And you're wondering, oh my word, how, how do they do this? You know, if you chop off your hand today, it will more than certainly not regenerate. Please don't do that, okay? But for axolotls, if their arms get amputated, they will in fact grow back. And this has got to do with a very, very highly specialized cell in, the, in their bodies. And you have these cells too, but axolotls have lots of them. They're stem cells. And some of you have learned about stem cells before. And what stem cells have the unique ability to do is to differentiate into every other cell type. So the stem cells can differentiate into bone and to flesh and to tissue and to nervous tissue and fully regenerate the limb. We know this because in cell biology, we have a little technology utilizing fluorescent protein. And what we're able to do is we're able to tag fluorescent protein to very specific cells in animals. So under specific light, they glow. And then we know the tissues in the animal that contain stem cells. So when we tag, say, the stem cells of this frog with fluorescent protein, we know exactly where in this frog there are fluorescent, uh, where there are stem cells, behind the eyes, down the vertebral column, in the limbs. We know where the stem cells are. This is the same technology that's used in cancer research. If you want to know where the cancer cancerous tissues are, we tag the cancerous tissues to the fluorescent protein, they glow, and we know where the cancer is. And we use a lot of that in cancer research. What happens if we tag the stem cells of an axolotl with this fluorescent protein? The entire animal glows. The whole animal glows. What does that tell you? That tells you that virtually every tissue in this animal contains stem cells. So if you chop off a leg, it'll grow back. If you chop off one of the gills, it'll grow back. If you chop off the tail, it'll grow back. If you chop off the head, it will die. I'm sorry, okay? So obviously there are limits to this thing. So wouldn't that be nice if we can utilize stem cells in a more therapeutic way? Um, one in three of us, one in three of us will suffer a cardiovascular disease. That's because we're eating more and more sugar and more and more fast food and more and more processed food, okay? So think twice the next time you, 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 you want to consider eating, you know, something delicious, okay, from, from a fast food chain. One in three of us will suffer a cardiovascular disease. And at this stage, um, the only therapies that are currently available are everything from, you know, heavy medication right down to heart transplantation. Wouldn't it be cool if, if you are predisposed to heart condition or if you are suffering from a heart disease, if we're able to inject stem cells directly into your heart and the stem cells start getting to work repairing the diseased tissue, wouldn't that be cool? It would be absolutely phenomenal. And do you know what? We can already do that. This is a fully functional heart that is created with nothing but stem cells. Okay, this is a fully functional heart, except this is a rat's heart. The next step is the human heart. And we are actually doing a lot of that work at, U at UQ. A lot of biomedical scientists are involved in these sorts of therapies. And at UQ, within our School of Biomedical Sciences, we have a center, we have a center of cardiac and vascular disease. And they do a lot of work on stem cell therapy, which is, of course, inspired by the axolotl, which is able to regenerate its tissue so quickly. So remember that you, we actually have to thank our natural world, again, the natural world that we're losing at an alarming rate. But we have to thank so many of the plants and the animals for, you know, just human survival and progress. So um, hopefully it gives you an idea of, you know, just how dynamic these systems are. And if again, you're wondering, what are some of the careers involved in this field? Well, so many, right? Because we spoke a while ago, again, people that understand animal behavior, stem cell biologists that understand um, these tiny little things. Um, you know, uh, stem cell is obviously 
um, also related to genetic, you know, geneticists understand the sequences and the genomes that are responsible for those stem cells and what triggers the stem cells to start differentiating. Biomedical scientists largely deal with these sorts of research, looking at different ways to form future therapeutics. And then, of course, you have the biotechnologists that are able to take these ideas and turn those ideas into viable products and services. So if you're wondering, you know, which end of this spectrum you might find yourself in, limitless. There are so many different things and so many different careers that ultimately transition to something really, really good. And of course, the doctors and the nurses that actually interact with the patients. But they are nothing, of course, without us scientists. Remember that. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed those two stories. Okay, I'll just take it off from there now. I know there's a plate of nasty lemma because I'm very, very hungry now. Okay, so um, I really hope you enjoyed those um, two stories. Uh, I promise you I'll bring you back to the nasty lemma. Okay, I don't know if you call it nasty lemma over there um, or nasi champur, right, Fitria? Nasi champur, which is mix and match, right? See, my Indonesian is not so bad. But in Singapore, where I'm from, and Malaysia, that dish nasi lemak is uh, their national dish, as you know, and uh, one of my favorites. Okay, enough about food because I'm starting to get hungry. I really do hope that you enjoyed that little seminar. I'm gonna wrap things up very quickly now, um, but before we do that, do any of you have any questions for me? If you do have a question, please feel free to type it into the chat group. If you're shy, don't worry, please. Uh, you can message me privately um, so I can share your question with everyone else. Have you got any questions about what we've just covered today or any questions um, beyond that as well? We're happy to take care of it. I really, really do hope you enjoyed the, the lecture and maybe learned a little bit more or a different perspective on, on these things. Uh, any of you have any questions? Yes, Dr. Gillian. Go for it. Yes, I am Zaki from Ireland, doctor. Uh, my question is, um, so based on your um, beautiful explanation, uh, is that possible we create a new species like um, ge genetically new, for example, like, like, like combining the DNA of one butterfly to the other butterfly so can create new kind of species. Is that possible, Doctor? That is an absolutely great question. Whether or not based on our understanding of genetics, whether we're able to create new species. The short answer is no, because the definition of a species is really to create an organism that can breed with similar organisms and nothing else. That's what a species is. The issue when we use genetic modification to create new organisms is oftentimes existing species are not necessarily compatible. And the other complication is how large what we call the genome of organisms are. So the genome is your entire genetic sequence. Every single detail that is responsible for everything from the way we look um, to some of our innate behaviors. The human genome is three billion base pairs long. In other words, if you want to create a new species based on genetics, you need to understand the function of each and every one of those three billion base pairs and then substitute the correct one to create something new. We are far from that sort of technology. Now, then we come to another concept of domestication. For example, why are there so many dog breeds? How about chicken breeds? So many different type of chicken, right? And plants, so many different type of crops that we eat, okay? So, for example, um, what do you find in, see, and I'm thinking about nasi champur again. So, you know, if you have something like uh, cucumber, right? Cucumber is a vegetable that we all know. But cucumber is a melon, rock melon, watermelon, 
are also forms of cucumbers, yet they look so very different. Again, you could consider those new species because they are very different from each other and we have genetically modified them, except we haven't played around in a lab to create watermelon, cucumber, honeydew. We have done that through centuries of selective breeding. So to answer your question more definitively, we can create new species using selective breeding, where we pick particular qualities and traits of existing organisms and force them to reproduce with each other to a point where we create something that can no longer breed with what it used to be. That is what we've done for centuries in agriculture and livestock production and pets, okay? We've done this for ages. Now we understand genetics a little bit more and we will use genetics in order to modify existing species, but not to create new ones. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is we're able now to identify specific fragments of, gen of genes that cause, say, disease. Alzheimer's disease, for example, is a, is a genetic disease. So some of the work being done at UQ is identifying the genes that cause Alzheimer's disease and using genetic modification to switch off those genes. So if you are predisposed to Alzheimer's disease, future therapy will include injecting you with, uh, I, I, there's, there's not enough time to explain it, but but injecting you with a genetic therapy that will basically switch off those genes. Or in the case of agriculture, we're not again creating new species, but maybe turning off genes that make them susceptible to insect pests or drought resistant, making them more drought tolerant so they need less water or making them produce fruit twice as much. Uh, all of that genetic technology can, you, can, can, can achieve. That's a great question. So it was quite a long answer. But in, 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 uh, in short, genetic technology cannot create new species. And if it could, we probably shouldn't. Um, that is a short and sweet answer. Okay, we have time for one more question. Thank you, Doctor. Okay, anybody else have a question? Don't worry, if you're shy, feel free to type it in. Awesome. Okay. I don't think there are any, any questions. Hi, Dr. G. I have oh, a yeah, question. Yeah. Okay, go for it. About the stem cell. You show us that it already applied to like heart, right? Can can we apply it to like in the future to do to, to our hand or our finger or anything else in our body? Great question. Is that possible? Yeah, great question. So essentially, can is that technology be is so the example I used was um, uh, with the rehabilitation of heart only because that kind of work is done at UQ. Um, not forgetting, yes, of course, stem cells. See, the beauty of stem cells is their ability to differentiate into virtually every other, stem, uh, every other cell type. So needless to say, we can use stem cells in a variety of ways. And this um, goes down the whole line of, um, you know, therapeutic cloning. So in essence, taking your own cells and then cloning organs that are compatible with your body. So what will happen is, uh, it, it is a lot more complex than that, but if let's say you had a heart disease, I can't give you my stem cells. There is a chance that it's incompatible and there's going to be complications with that procedure. So the theory is taking your own stem cells produced in your bone marrow and then introducing it to parts of your body that are diseased. And under the correct conditions, those stem cells should repair damaged tissue. They should be able to recognize because they're from the same, same body. So that's the theory, okay? Uh, obviously, we are a while away from putting it into good use, um, but you know, it's good to know that people are advancing in that space. Excellent question. Hey, that's awesome. That's really, really wonderful. So I'd like to leave everyone with a few food for thoughts now before I hand the time back over to Eileen, okay? So if you would just indulge me, I need to go back to my Nazi chamber to show you because I want to show you that all of you, would be, all of you would, there's a bit of feedback there. 
Okay, hopefully you can all hear me now. Um, hopefully, uh, all of you know that, you know, in some shape and form, you're going to, you're going to uh, need to provide for your loved ones in the future, in the same way that your support system, oh goodness, there's a bit of feedback there. I think people need to mute their microphone. Um, thank you. Uh, so all I wanted to leave you on a thought with is that so many people are going to obviously join the whole rat race and need to get a, a, a good job so that they can um, provide for their family. So you need to feed your family, but who's going to feed the world? Well, scientists are going to feed the world. Scientists are the one creating new goods for tomorrow. Yellow rice here is a very good example and fish and beta carotene. And we can now offer disadvantaged children in Africa access to basic vitamins that they lack during their vision development. Many of us want to get prestigious jobs or what is traditionally thought of as prestigious jobs like doctors or nurses or dentists. And those jobs are very meaningful and very satisfying. But remember, doctors treat diseases. Scientists cure diseases because scientists are the people behind understanding how our bodies work and then designing the drugs and vaccines of tomorrow. You are also familiar that UQ is the very first university in the world that has developed a vaccine against cancer. This is for cervical cancer that only women are predisposed to. But you know, ladies, what it means now is that there's a vaccine and for the rest of your life, you will never ever have to worry about cervical cancer. Only 200 other cancers that can kill you, but at least you've taken care of one, right? And of course, some of you might have seen and you saw my little sign up at the top of my screen. Uh, we have just begun preclinical testing for our COVID-19 vaccine. So we're the only Australian organization tasked um, with the development, uh, expedited development of the COVID-19 vaccine and we've come quite a long way. Finally, I know some of you are thinking about a career, maybe working with animals, whether as vets or vet nurses or at zoos or at sanctuaries in conservation. Some of my wonderful students that I've taught who have gone back to Indonesia are my master's students, my master's of conservation biology students that are now doing really good work protecting some of Indonesia's most vulnerable wildlife, everything from orangutans to sharks. Um, but remember that while these people are out there working and saving animals, it really are the scientists that protect a lot of the species that we are losing. And this orang utan is Indonesia's national treasure, just like giant pandas are for China and mud skippers are for Singapore. You have orang utans here for Indonesia. And this population in Sumatra has actually learned how to use tools to build their own nests. Where did they learn these from? From humans that they're interacting with. So I, I'd like for this to be my ending slide for you all because it's such an inspirational image of our not so distant cousin, the orang utan. And we have a lot to learn from our, our best friends here because like the orang utan, I hope all of you aspire to be just like them. Not, not look like them, okay? But to be just as adaptable as them. The environment is constantly changing. We're all very comfortable now at school. I promise you, those of you that come to university, you'll still be very comfortable at university. Take a step out into the working world and you will know that the environment is constantly changing. So I do hope and wish all of you the very, very best. And hopefully that you, like our not so distant cousin, the orangutan, can remain as adaptable to changes in our environment. And we do that by being lifelong learners. So by taking the time today, one hour in your afternoon to learn something new and interesting about science, that is your first step into lifelong learning. And I hope all of you, especially the students attending today, take that ethos and take that principle back with you for the rest of your lives. Don't ever stop learning. Okay, with that, thank you very much. Let me hand the time back over now to Eileen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. G. Thank you very much. So before we end this session, can we all turn on our video together so we can take a picture? All right, cool. Yang mau, silahkan, yang mau, apa? 
Uh, we are. I thought they were twins because just now I remember Matthew popped up and then. Uh -huh. Yeah. I said, oh God, they look similar. And now they're in the same camera. And, oh, <laughs> <laughs> right. Wait a minute. I count to three. Okay. One, two, three. One more. I will screenshot my laptop on three. One, two, three. Thank you very much, Dr. G, and everyone. Thank you, Dr. G. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Thank Thank you everybody. But Fitri, do you want to say something, maybe? Yep. For the audience. Thank you, uh, students, teman-teman uh, uh, coming to the uh, UQ uh, um, online lecture. I hope you really enjoying it, and um, uh, I'm hoping to see you all at UQ. Thank you, Ma. Thank you. Awesome. awesome. Thank you so much for um having us dr g thank you so much bavitri thank you so much everyone thank you so much see you Bye. see you when i go to uq dr g thank you and i'm also coming to indonesia don't worry so yes. 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 Right, right right thank you thank you we will treat you nasi lemak oh no 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 nasi campur better and, 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 from the sate house, Petra would Petra know exactly where I want to go. Sate house and ABC. Thank you so much again. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mrs. Grace. Bye. Thank you, Mrs. Grace. Thank you. Thank you, Dita. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.